All things Colin's Last Stand, the YouTube gaming series SideQuest, the PlayStation podcast Sacred Symbols, the Nostalgia and Retro podcast Knockback, and the eclectic interview series Fireside Chats are brought to you by thousands of patrons of CLS at patreon.com slash Stand. If you like any or all of what I do, please consider supporting CLS on Patreon. Not only does your support allow the CLS brand to continue, but it nets you perks too, such as exclusive podcasts, early ad-free podcast access, the ability to vote on show topics and submit mail to the shows, and much more. Thank you for your kindness, generosity, and support. I truly appreciate it. Now, on to the show. There's no denying that, as both a publisher and a developer, Konami's reputation has taken a serious hit in recent years, particularly during the development of and following the release of Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear Solid V in 2015. For many of us that have been playing games for decades, though, it's still hard to wrap our heads around Konami's precipitous fall, because for many years, the famous Japanese company was at the forefront of quality gaming. In the NES, SNES, and PS1 days in particular, they were a completely dominant force, and one of the industry's most respected names. These days, though, they're far quieter, especially when it comes to one of their once marquee franchises, Castlevania. That's why it was such a pleasant surprise when, just last month, Konami revealed that a Castlevania collection of sorts would be coming exclusively to PS4 under the moniker of Castlevania Requiem. Requiem would combine the seldom played Rondo of Blood with its direct sequel, the greatest Castlevania game ever, Symphony of the Night. Could this be a sign of things to come? Is Konami testing the waters with a franchise that had, up to this point, skipped our entire current console generation? Would the publisher be wiggling out of its cocoon just a little bit? The reality is, the two games within this collection are delivered faithfully, and they're both a ton of fun to play, particularly Symphony of the Night, which is widely considered one of the greatest games ever made. But here's the thing. There was no effort put into this package, seemingly whatsoever. Rondo and Symphony share a robust and cleverly named trophy list, which is awesome, but that's where the frills suddenly and noticeably end. In a climate where rival publisher Capcom is releasing thoughtful and put-together collections that give players not only the games themselves, but tons of art, soundtracks, challenges, and other cool perks, Konami's Castlevania Requiem is woefully inadequate. This isn't the first time these two games have found themselves bundled together. 2007's Dracula X Chronicles on PSP was a remake of Rondo of Blood, with Symphony of the Night unlockable within, so it makes it all the stranger that the publisher didn't take the time to put some meat on the bones, as it were. It could have been just as effective releasing these games as individual standalone titles. So yes, it's easy to gripe about Castlevania Requiem, its cheap and amateur menus, and its complete lack of artwork, audio, and more that could celebrate all of the amazing and meaningful elements of this beloved three-decade-old plus franchise. But in reality, just getting access to Rondo of Blood and Symphony of the Night on PS4 is pretty awesome, and so it's easy to forgive Konami's complete laziness when we get to play such important games from the publisher's golden era. Better yet, in exploring two different types of Castlevania games within Requiem, the classic so-called old-style Castlevania, and the Metroidvania style of Castlevania that the series readily and almost wholly embraced as it aged, we're taken on a bit of a journey through the franchise's early and mid-years. And since the games are intimately connected in terms of plot and characters, we're also given the option to explore a full arc in the larger story of the Belmonts, Dracula, and his devious and dangerous castle. Rondo of Blood is a mystical Castlevania game to many players, having never seen Western release until the aforementioned PSP iteration finally gave fans access outside of Japan. Launched in the fall of 1993 on the Japanese PC Engine, what we knew in Western markets as TurboGrafx-16, Rondo of Blood came packing an additional layer of complexity, as it actually required the PC Engine's CD-ROM add-on to play. Built in the spirit of the original Castlevania and Super Castlevania 4, but most keenly modeled after Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse, Rondo of Blood tells the story of Richter Belmont, and takes place some 300 years after the original Castlevania trilogy. Richter Belmont uses a whip to fight, just like his ancestors, and he's slow, plodding, and methodical in his movements and attacks. Indeed, Rondo of Blood is a difficult game, just like the titles that spawned it, and will almost certainly provide you a much greater challenge than its sequel. Rondo of Blood's Castlevania 3 influence shines through in two primary and obvious ways. It has a non-linear approach to stages, with optional areas to explore and levels to access. Likewise, it also has multiple playable characters. It won't be long until you unlock a young girl named Maria, a child with strong magical attacks, but little ability to withstand damage when compared to the slower but more powerful Richter. These approaches obviously invoke Castlevania 3's sprawling map and four playable characters, and since Castlevania 3 is widely considered one of the best, if not the best, classic-style Castlevania game, it's an awesome choice to draw inspiration. But the references aren't only vague, they can be quite literal. There are tons of throwbacks to the original Castlevania and Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest here, especially when it comes to settings and enemies, and you'll hear tons of familiar rearranged music too. Castlevania is often incestuous like this, which is actually awesome. If you're not in for a difficult experience though, and you don't have that old school pedigree, Rondo of Blood may just eat you alive. 
It's authentically difficult and requires its share of patience to see through to the end, alongside a desire to do things repeatedly until you learn, get better, and maybe even get a little lucky. Exploring all it has to offer in pursuit of a 100% completion rating is a ton of fun though, and I'm enjoying edging my way further and further towards that goal. Sure, the cutscenes and voice acting are antiquated, but put yourself in 1993 and imagine how amazing these features were if you're used to playing on SNES or Genesis, two consoles that couldn't dare run Rondo of Blood as is, perhaps one of the reasons why it found itself stranded for so long, both domestically and around the world. It wasn't until Virtual Console that Westerners even had the opportunity to play it as it is. The real star of this package, though, is undoubtedly Symphony of the Night, and it's there I imagine that most players will spend most, if not all, of their time. Symphony of the Night takes place five years following the events of Rondo of Blood, and though you begin your adventure as Richter Belmont, you'll actually spend your first playthrough in the role of Alucard, Dracula's half-human son first introduced seven real-life years prior in Castlevania III. Symphony of the Night is a totally different Castlevania game than literally anything that came before it, even if there's undoubtedly Castlevania II's blood flowing through its veins. Its greatest analog is actually 1994's Super Metroid, a game that clearly inspired its approach and helped spawn the Metroidvania genre moniker that describes both games and claims both of them as its parents. If Rondo of Blood is slow, Symphony of the Night is fast. If Rondo is difficult, Symphony is manageable. If Rondo is largely linear, Symphony is anything but. Rondo can be beaten by a skilled player in around an hour, but Symphony will take you at least 10 if you do and see everything. Above all else though, if Rondo is a classic side-scrolling action game, Symphony is the same only in direct gameplay. That's because it's actually a deep RPG to boot with statistics, leveling, experience points, equipment, and more. Like I said, Castlevania II technically did a lot of this first, but not anywhere close to this extent. Symphony of the Night is an absolute joy to play. Indeed, its gameplay is so buttery smooth and simplistic in premise that it has an addictive quality to it. I've beaten Symphony of the Night more than a dozen times since I got my copy upon launch in 1997 back on PS1, but I still found myself awake at 5 in the morning playing the game as if it was my first time, losing track of everything around me, immersed in its world. And that's really what Symphony of the Night is all about, atmosphere and immersion. It's endlessly impressive just how fully realized, gorgeous, and ambient a 2D game can be. Then again, there are very few games that utilize pixel art more beautiful than what you'll find here, and you'd be hard-pressed to find a game with finer animations, more thoughtful enemy designs, and a more sprawling, epic, and wonderful setting, in this case Dracula's Castle that, if you play your cards right, you'll fight your way through twice, once with some ease, the second time through a little less so. What's ultimately so appealing about Symphony of the Night, what ultimately keeps it in the conversation of best all-time games 21 years after it launched, is how all of its disparate components combine into something not only fully coherent, but perfectly designed. Pardon the pun, but it truly is a symphony of components, gameplay, art, music, layout, RPG mechanics, and more, that are all executed with unimaginable skill and vision. The results speak for themselves. Symphony of the Night is, like Mario 3 or Super Mario World, Mega Man 2 and 3 and others, a must-play video game from the 2D era. Every gamer should experience it, and now is as good a time as any to do so, whether you're new to the genre, franchise, or just to this game. It's true, though, that you don't need to buy this collection to play it. If you don't own it on PS1, you can always buy the PS1 Classic version for PS3 or Vita, or play it on Xbox 360 and Xbox One. And who knows if it'll be in that PlayStation Classic console Sony's launching in December. It would certainly make a lot of sense to include it there. And in some of those iterations, you'll be lucky enough to avoid the re-recorded voice tracks present here. Either way though, Castlevania Requiem is a bare-bones, lazy collection of two great games, great games worth purchasing and playing. While it's a true shame that Konami didn't put in the effort to match rival Capcom's approach to their contemporary collections of classic games, it's still awesome to be able to play these two titles on a new console, particularly so with Rondo of Blood, which is a rarer experience to be had. Requiem is a no-brainer investment for Castlevania fans, side-scrolling and old-school gamers, and those interested in playing one of gaming history's very best offerings in Symphony of the Night. I just would have loved to see these two games receive even more love on the back end, because beautiful concept art, a thoughtfully composed soundtrack, and perhaps even some challenges or extra modes could have really brought this entire package to the next level. Alas, it is what it is. And knowing what Konami has more recently become, we're probably lucky it is what it is at all.